My name is uh, James Lee. I'm the editor of the Sydney Review of Books. Um, and this is uh, Australian Literature 102. Um, thank you all for coming along this evening. Uh, I have with me tonight um, Alice Pung, uh, who uh, you will, many of you will know her work from uh, such publications as The Monthly, uh, The Good Weekend, The Age, uh, Best Australian Stories in the Engine. She's the author, she is also the author of uh, two memoirs, Unpolished Gem and Her Father's Daughter, and recently the editor of an anthology called uh, Growing Up Asian in Australia. Uh, and Alice is here to talk to us uh, today about Ruth Park's uh, The Harp in the South. Uh, so we'll let Alice uh, give her talk and then we'll have a bit of a chat about it. Thank you, Alice. Thanks, James. I'll just go up there and give my yeah. talk I've got papers. Please do. Okay. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight to talk about one of my favourite authors, Ruth Park. It's very windy outside, so I'm glad you could all make it. Now, I came across Ruth Park's work, like many children who grew up in the 80s, through her young adult novel, Plain Beatty Bow. And then last year, I had the great honour of writing the introduction to the text release of this extraordinary book, Swords and Crowns and Rings which won the Miles Franklin Prize in the 1970s, 1977. So the new edition looks like this. And um, tonight I'm going to talk about her very first novel. How many of you have read Harp in the South? Oh, that's wonderful. So <laughs> what I'm going to talk about in relation to Harp in the South, because 90% of the room have, has read this novel, is one thing I found very interesting about it was its portrayal of class. And this is very relevant today um, to Australian society because I was at a Wheeler Centre event two years ago sitting right here where you were sitting in this room. And I came to see a very popular author named John Ronson. Has anyone heard of John Ronson? OK, some of you have. He's, he's a um, British author. And he came out with a book called The Psychopath Test. So it was a book about how you determine if someone is a psychopath. And he'd gone into all sorts of places, prisons and, you know, um, a very wealthy man who was actually diagnosed as a psychopath. And John Ronson has this really personable way of interviewing people. So he has no preconceptions and he doesn't judge people. So that's how he got got these psychopaths, you know, one in the prison to talk to him. And... Um, for some reason, I think when it was question and answer time, the, some members of the audience were trying to explain the concept of the Australian bogan to him because he was an Australian. And he kept saying, well, yeah, but I don't understand. Who are these people? What do they do? What, what, what does it mean? And people from the audience shouted out various things like, oh, a bogan. Bogan, you know, he says, what do they do? And, and they said... A bogan is like a miner, and someone said, no, like a truckie. And someone else said, a bogan is like a builder. And um, John Ronson said, so you're telling me you're, you're making fun of like the working class in this country? And people said, no, no, we don't make fun of them, you know. But they were making fun. They got frustrated. They said, no, they're not the working class poor because some bogans have a lot of money. They're cashed up. And um, <laughs> you could see the audience starting to get very frustrated because John Ronson was refusing to be in on the joke, to be in of making fun of these bogans. And he kept saying, he was baffled. He said, so these miners and truckies work hard and they earn some money and they use it to buy things and you're making fun of that. Is that what this bogan, um, this, this bogan derision is about, and no one could pinpoint what they were making fun of. But what I think it was was precisely these two things that we presume a certain class lacks. Firstly, self-awareness, and secondly, culture, which gives us the, um, you know, the the key to make fun with the, of them and which we at that moment in that room in the Wheeler Centre all had. You know, we we're all self-aware and we all had some degree of class um, that John Ronson wasn't understanding. So when I read this great book, um, Harp in the South, it, it really spoke to me. So I'll tell you a little bit about 
Ruth Park, you know, just to remind you. She was born in New Zealand and she lived through the Great Depression. So she came to Australia after she fell in love and married the writer Darcy Nyland. And she worked in a, a series of jobs, a shearer's cook, a fruit picker, opal miner, secretary and housekeeper, before raising a young family in the suburb of Surrey Hills, which is ironically a very wealthy suburb in Sydney now but back then when this book came out it was a slum and James and I were speaking back there and we were quite you know we said this is incredible this woman who had five kids raising a young family in Surrey Hills she described it as an antique island where the 19th century still prevailed and it was a really feral dirty and dank place to live in in the early 20th century but it's also where she set her award-winning first book based on her observations while living above a shop in Devonshire Street. Now she and her husband were struggling to live as freelance writers and this is extraordinary. She and her husband would write 60,000 words a week and that, that's a novel. <laughs> that, that is this. Selling only about 15,000 and they just scrap the rest or recycle it into other material and their fortunes changed when Harp in the South won the inaugural Sydney Morning Herald novel competition in 1946 and it was published in 1948. It took a while to get published because um, some publishers weren't interested in it and James actually has a first edition sitting here on the desk. So, um, <laughs> Is it a genuine first edition? Yes, so like the works of Dickens, it was serialised in the newspaper and it actually caused quite a furor because people were scandalised that a young and quite attractive woman wrote this book. It has child abuse in it, it has prostitution, it has abortion, gruesome accidents, alcoholism and street violence. And many critics, um, mostly men, said it had no literary merit and presumably, you know, it's quite interesting, those same critics would praise writers like John Steinbeck for their gritty realism. Now, in fact, the runner-up of the competition was a man named John Cleary, who also wrote about the Sydney slums, and he didn't attract any censure. There was a priest at that time, Ruth Park writes about him in her autobiography, who stood at the pulpit and denounced her book as the devil's work, while another one praised it as an influential moral work in its portrayal of compassion. So when I read the work of Steinbeck and Carson McCullers and Ruth Park, I'm reminded of how important the role of literature is to helping us understand the marginalised. It is often tacitly assumed that the middle upper classes make art while the lower classes make crafts and decorations, just like it's assumed, or has been assumed for a long time, that Western culture created great music and literature, while Oriental and African cultures create folk art, fables, and gangster rap, which is true, they did, <laughs> but that's not recognised as an art form. So deeply entrenched is this idea that the poor are not creators of culture that we're deeply suspicious, even today, of another author or any author who goes on at length about their working class roots and we try and work out whether they are disingenuous or for real because, after all, the hot and struggling masses, as Fitzgerald called them, you know, they're not going to have the energy or inclination to write literature. Most of us also, as children, were taught that museums were places where we could learn about our past. But for most of us, this is interesting, our forebears and ancestors didn't live in a way that would be preserved in a museum. In museums of the future, for instance, imagine you probably wouldn't see our $10 Kmart shower curtains or those $20 fiberglass Buddhas in every aspiring middle lower class household that we had a decade ago. What you see are the things that are unused, the beautiful hand-sewn ball gowns and crinolines in the Werribee mansion, the silverware of rich Victorian era families, a piece of art from the Museum of Modern Art or a preserved Queen Anne facade on a Turak house. We don't see disposables in museums, the worn out clothes of the poor or their scruff shoes. These things would have been used until they were rags or scraps. You don't see their plates or cutlery. So we only know how the Darcy's lived because Ruth Park lived this way herself for a number of years. And this is the magic and necessity of literature to preserve lives that would be lost forever through poverty and neglect. 
Now, as Ruth Park writes about the Darcy family in her autobiography, she says, in the midst of their dirt and poverty and fecklessness, they contrived to be happy. They tried to live with dignity and kindness. When Rowena gets married, the Chinese neighbor, Lick Jimmy, brings her a bolt of pink silk, which her Darcy's accept with warmth and gratitude. But afterwards, they laugh about it. Now, this is a the difference. They laugh about it. They don't laugh about their neighbour. And they say, what a waste it is, because it's pink. And only abos, back then they weren't politically correct, only ab abo women wore such garish colours. This is a family that has standards, you know? It's just like today, the bogans who wear fascinators to the races, or just like working class Southeast Asians, would never be caught dead in those popular Thai fisherman pants that you see in Ligon Street. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. Australians have this wonderful, great, self-depreciating sense of humour that you see in television today, you know, if you ever see the um, episodes of Middle Upper Bogan. And yet sometimes it's not the most subtle analytical tool. Now, the fool in Shakespeare's comedies never got beheaded because he knew how to tell great political truths to the king in a nuanced way. Poor Australians and ethnic or black Australians have had a history of having to develop a thick skin because our sense of humour involves, well, constantly insulting ourselves or padding ourselves up with bu bubble wrap suits of sarcasm and irony. In shows like Middle Upper Bogan or movies like The Castle, the working class are portrayed as earnest and simple, while the middle upper classes are portrayed as cold and analytical but clearly the smarter ones. And this is also true of our advertisements. You notice if you flick through a copy of Vogue magazine, none of the models are ever smiling. But the lower you go down in the fashion hierarchy, the happier they become until the ads in Bess and Less and Target have people pra practically ecstatic to be modeling $8 underwear. That's true. So the character of the poor has been portrayed in popular culture, in our popular culture, in one of two ways, as a bunch of marshmallow-hearted battlers or like a bit like a rank off milk, an uncultured mass of sour glob. They are either seen as racist, uneducated whingers from places like Frankston or Ipswich who hold knee-jerk viewpoints, or really kind-hearted but quite baffled people like the family in the castle. So the harp in the south, it's about an Irish family, Hugh, the drunk dad, Mama, who is growing fatter every year, 19-year-old Rowena who gets pregnant by her first love and 12-year-old Dollar. They sound like the family of the Simpsons or the Honey Boo Boo Child if you were to transpose them in today's society and today's culture, but they wouldn't exist because they're not the family of the Simpsons and they're not the family of American reality television because although Park encourages to laugh and cry with them, she's very, very careful that we don't laugh at them because it's not funny to get pregnant when you're a teenage Irish Catholic and you've never been taught to say no to a boy. It's not really that hilarious that hard-working mama is so fat because the only cuts of meat she can afford are the bad ones or that dollar is a, has a brain but has to leave school at 15. But this is also a book with a lot of humour in it. It's just not targeted at the people whom she portrays. So although Harp in the South is peopled with colourful characters like the Chinese Lick Jimmy and the part Aboriginal Charlie, it also reveals a lot about the assumptions of the working class at the time. And this is coming from one of the characters of the book. She says, what I say is I ain't got no business allowing foreigners in this country's chows. Yes, nobody can wash a collar like a chow, but not the blasted Dutch. Anyone with corners on their head is next best thing to a German, I always say. <laughs> you know, this is so funny because it's so relevant today. And yet this is a very generous woman, Dally Stock, the local town prostitute who gives a lot of money to the school for the children to have a picnic. And this is a very poignant scene because the reporters come because all these poor children are having a picnic. You know, they're getting on the school bus and all these wowsers are taking pictures of these children who have never had a picnic before. And some parents are unhappy about it, but other parents see it as a wonderful opportunity because little Johnny will be in the newspaper and they can cut it out and it's the closest thing they'll ever have to a photograph. That's how poor these folks were. 
And Mama talks to her husband, Huey, about their oldest daughter marrying a really nice and decent man, not the one who knocked her up. And she says, it's because there's nigger in him, Huey. I'm scared of it and no mistake. And Hugh says defiantly, it's better than chink. It's real Australian and no matter how bad that is, there's none better. Then he lapsed into silence, seeing the same picture that haunted Mama of himself out there on the veranda nursing a sooty grandchild. I'll speak to him about it when he comes this evening, said Hugh, and immediately fell into a state of nervousness in case his impulsive tongue offended Charlie and ruined Rowie's chances. Now this speaks volumes about the great love of a father towards his daughter. But you know what? It also tells you something about his feelings towards his future son-in-law. You can tell Hugh really likes and respects Charlie. And um, if we were to take a black and white reading of it, you'd think... These guys are really racist, you know. They've they got things against the Chinese. They've got things against the Indigenous Australians. They don't really. And there is a difference between um, their actions and the ideas because despite all their racist ramblings, the Darcys love their part Indigenous son-in-law and Chinese neighbour. Their actions speak louder than their words. Shirley Walker describes Park's work as classics of the vernacular of the ordinary people and what ordinary peoples don't feel fear about the unfamiliar? If we take it to present day Australia, you know, we just had an election that came about recently. And um, I grew up in the, the suburbs of Braybrook and, and Footscray and Sunshine, which were equally working class. There weren't slums there, but you could understand the fear. So you'll recognize the Darcy family and say, hey, I know people like that or for some of us, I'm related to people like that, or I was related to people like that only a generation ago. And chances are, you also actually like these people. I love this book so much because I grew up um, in Braybrook where my best friend's father was a One Nation supporter who always helped my brother and I cross the road as kids, and he saved the best party favors for us. I grew up at a time when the 1983 recession hit the western suburbs hard and the people who were kind towards us always looked at, you know, also looked at our ilk as job stealers and I remember waiting at the traffic lights when my best friend's dad hadn't picked, you know, took, taken us across the road and my mum was coming to collect us and this car just drives slowly past and the windows get wound down and, and these teenage boys said, oi, use, use get back home, you know, get, go, go home and, and stop stealing our jobs. And now English teachers everywhere, I'm sure there are some in this room will say that use is not a word, but in Brave Rock, it's a perfectly legitimate word. It meant more than two people. And so me and my brother looked at each other and by the time my mother reached us, she said, what were those boys saying? And we had no idea. It went over our heads. We were kids. We didn't understand politics. I'm sure those boys didn't understand that much about politics either. And um, we were 30 seconds from our doorstep, so we were going home. And my mum was an outworker in the garage, so I didn't understand the job stealing reference. But what I did understand um, as I became an adult was that People aren't generally racist. People are just scared. And those poor boys had been hit by the recession. Their dads, some of their dads had lost their jobs in this very working class, very safe neighborhood. And all of a sudden you turn on television and the only Asian faces you see are the gangsters in Footscray. And the only newspaper articles you read about are always crimes by the ethnics. You're suddenly going to develop certain views. And so um, I came of an age at a time when this lady, before she went on Dancing with the Stars, this really quite attractive red-headed politician said this of us in her maiden speech. She said, oh, don't like these Asians very much. They have their own culture and religion. They form ghettos and don't assimilate. And that is why I love Harp in the South so much. It is a book about a ghetto. It was a ghetto that was impenetrable until Ruth Park wrote it. And the same could be said of any of the working class neighborhoods in Australia of any race since time immemorial. As a teenager reading Ruth Park, 
You know, somehow her work hit the bright red target on my chest in a way Jane Austen never did. Carson McCullers, who's also a wonderful writer who wrote The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, she also gave voice to the rejected, mistreated, forgotten and oppressed, and she created complex characters of them. And one of my favourite characters is the tomboy Mick Kelly, who hears music for the first time and she dreams of having an instrument to the point of trying to make one out of scraps of string and, and tin that she finds around and bits of wood. And she's so frustrated because she can never play an instrument. And the other of my favourite character is Ruth Park's daughter Darcy, the daughter with the brain. She dreams of falling in love or entering the sisterhood of nuns. These are serious elevated dreams. Dreams. As a 12-year-old, she even enters a radio quiz show and Huey, her dad, is so sick with nerves on her behalf. You know, he's so scared that she'll make a fool of herself that he doesn't want to show up, so he just stays at home. She's scared that yeah, he's scared that she'll embarrass herself and um, her older sister lends her this bright garish blouse and she kind of looks ridiculous on stage and the dad actually sneaks out the back and he, he turns up to see his daughter and he's very mortified. It's just like families who have a loved one on the X Factor or Australian Idol, you know, <laughs> she's put on show and her dad doesn't want the smug middle class people laughing at her. The working class have always been characterised not only by their lack of money, but their lack of those two things. Firstly, the self-awareness, which makes them go on shows like reality television or um, The X Factor. And secondly, the lack of culture. And it was this fear that penetrated poor Hugh Darcy. It's only as if a certain type of person can be self-aware and cultured, and yet Dollar goes through the quiz show, she answers all the trivia, and like Ruth Park, she wins the monetary prize. And her dad, who snuck at the back to watch her, he's so proud he wants to get drunk straight away. So <laughs> Ruth Park does not put on a pedestal the pedestrian people she writes about. She's not trying to make you feel sorry for the Darcy family. She's trying to get you to understand them, not as caricatures, but as humans. She wrote Harp in the South at a time when the term bogan had not come into existence, and yet people still had the same wary attitudes towards the working class. You can really feel her affection for these people, open and sincere, and not armed with steely weapons of irony or sarcasm. She's not known as the Dickens of Australia without good reason. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that, Alice. That was uh, very interesting. I, and it occurred to me as you were talking about um, class there, um, one of the interesting things about this book is, um, and, and is that it's quite, uh, and one of the reasons you you, you don't sort of feel um, uh, you know the, the characters being condescended to is is because it's, it's actually quite enclosed, isn't it? That world um, that she creates. I mean, everybody everybody's kind of in that that world uh, together in a sense. Um, uh, do, do you get that sense as well? I mean, I, I, I'm thinking in particular, say, of, of the scene in which uh, they have the uh, New Year's bonfire. Oh, yes. The... Yes. It, it is a very enclosed <laughs> world. Um, and they are very fearful of outsiders, you know, and I can understand that why they're fearful of outsiders. The outsiders are the people who are trying to um, knock down their old houses mm -hmm. and build them cheap flats, or the policemen who are trying to stop them from having a good time. And that scene of the bonfire, even the grandmother kicks in with, with throwing stones at the policemen. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right, and, and the firemen, you know. They, um, yeah. And it's, it's almost like uh, this, they, they, they the, the pride decrees that they have to look after themselves, you know, even the, the legitimate authorities uh, are, are kind of um, excluded or attacked and they have their own ethics and this is why um, uh, Dealey Stock is such an interesting character because she is kind of, you know, part of the criminal element, of course, yeah. but she is also one of the people who is... Um, you know, I, I guess you know a, a Robin Hood type figure almost. You're know, giving her, her ill-gotten uh, wealth to to help this kind of community. Yeah, that's true. But that's also part of our um, 
cultural heritage, I would say, because I I reckon 90% of us in this room would have connections to, you know, some rogue uncle or brother. We hail from convict stock, those of us who aren't Indigenous Australians and those of us who are immigrants. um, You know, I have some shady characters in my family back home. And they're part of your family. And this lady, Delhi Stock, who is the town... um, well, the town, madam, as you call it, but she, she's not as sophisticated as, as the term implies. She goes and tries to give money to the school, and you've got the clergy saying, oh, we, we can't accept your money because, you know, you've ruined many lives and you've ruined many families, and, and yet the town accepts her as one of their own. Well, uh, yeah, but but at the same time, of course, within that kind of enclosed world, they're also, everybody is conscious of those distinctions as well, the, the, the social distinction. I mean, you're talking about it as a as a social novel, and I think thinking about it in that way is, is quite interesting because um, one of the things we were talking about, you know, uh, backstage beforehand is that everybody in this novel is identifies as being from somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and this goes to, I think... Uh, it's actually one of the a kind of recurring idea in Australian literature that Australian literature is, in a certain sense, an immigrant literature, because everybody, you know, with the exception of uh, indigenous people, is from somewhere else eventually. Uh, and it's kind of interesting in this novel that everybody is still attached to some other external identity. That's um, so true. And what I found so fascinating about this book mm-hmm. was. Um, it speaks of the hierarchies of who has been here longest, which is a, a discussion we've had since time immemorial. And it really gave me great comfort because when I was growing up, you always felt like you were the refugee boat person, you know, <laughs> we've been here longer than you. And when I read Harp in the South, they were doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, and, and it seems to me that... It, one of the reasons, you know, all that consciousness about race doesn't uh-huh. doesn't feel kind of racist, even though often there are terms used in the in the book. You know, the term nigger appears in the book, for example, which I don't think anyone would use uh, these days. Um, one of the reasons I think the book as a whole doesn't feel racist in that sense is that it is enclosed and it does have that sort of supportive feel of the community but also there is this uh, kind of evolution I I think as it goes along that you can kind of sense the individual identities are being subsumed into this larger Australian identity Um, and I actually had a passage that I wanted to read just from the very end only only a couple of um, paragraphs Um, and it's Huey uh, um, and it's after um, the, the, the wedding with, um, uh, you know, Charlie has married Roey and they've had their baby. And there's, this, there's these two paragraphs that are really interesting where um, uh, they're sort of dreaming about escaping and going uh-huh. beyond Surrey Hills. And Park writes, they both knew that day would never come. Responsibilities anchored them, for Charlie's earning capacity was very limited, and day by day their bonds to the cheap and dirty portion of the city were made stronger. Perhaps they would struggle against it in their dreams, but no more than that. There were so many other things to consider too, their shyness and awkwardness with the people out of the outside world. Right, the outside world. We're talking the outside world is outside yeah. Surrey Hills, right? Yeah. Um, just as though they were inhabitants of an island lapped by the roaring traffic of the seas of the great city. Their consciousness of poor, their consciousness of poor halting speech and their inability to maintain any social standards, their tendency to shrink into and shelter within the warm, coarse, familiar things and places. They would grow old and die in Surrey Hills, as people have been doing for five generations. It was Mama's birthday, and little Moira was four months old. Huey had found it in his nature found in his nature strange depths of love for the little mite. For although he was Irish and sentimental, he was also Australian and thought the exhibition of it effeminate. Now, (laughs) when I read that, I mean, I think that's a really interesting encapsulation of, I think, some of the things you've been talking about. But one of the things that really jumps out at me is the word Australian appearing there. It's almost like you've gone all the way through this novel with people saying, I'm Irish and I'm Catholic, yeah. and they're, they're Jewish and you know, that's, they're Chinese. And then it comes around to this, this term, and, and it's, it's beautifully ambiguous because on one level they are 
accepting this collective identity. Uh, but, but at the same time, it's this little microcosm where they've, they are, in fact, trapped still within this little uh, impoverished uh, bubble. That's true, mm. yeah. Um, That's a great passage. Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the other thing, too, is language. I mean, and, and I, it seems to me that the language you talked about as, as a vernacular... Uh -huh. exercise in vernacular literature. It seems to me that language speaks to this quite directly in this novel. Did you, did you get that impression? I did, mm. yeah. She, Ruth Park wrote this book in less than two months or so at a kitchen table while she had a couple of kids. So it reads as if it all spilled out of her, but she was very talented because there, there's not a passage that is awkward or a passage that's contrived. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's some quite subtle differences. I mean, she, and she renders everybody's speech uh, differently, you know. The, 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 there's a whole range of accents uh, in this book too, aren't there? Um, some, of which, uh, some of which speak to, I think, class. I mean, I think one of the few, few characters who is sort of outside of this, this uh, enclosed world in a class sense is the pawnbroker, um, uh, Joseph Mendel. Yeah. Um, and do you, do you remember the scene with his um, when Huey goes in to kind of abuse him when he's drunk? Yes. Now that's that's a really interesting scene because he, um, Joseph Mendel can actually speak kind of received English. He can speak yeah. correctly, and Huey goes in to abuse him, and he ends up just swearing at him because he can't think of anything to say. <laughs> and this, I think this inarticulateness is something that Park is quite conscious of. Did you did you? I did. That in I saw two other instances of that. Mm. Well, when um, Rowie meets Joseph Mendel's son, Tommy, who mm. she falls in love with, there's this beautiful line where he says, so do you want to go to movies with me? And she's thinking of something deep and beautiful and insightful to reply back, but she's um, locked out by her uh, lack of education and by her insularity. And I think it was in those exact words. And she says, yeah, okay. <laughs> and she really gets into the mind of um, people who don't have a voice, because people who don't really have a voice, it doesn't mean their thoughts are less complex. It just means they're not as articulate. The other example of this is, um, there's a lady who lives upstairs of this Darcy family and the whole family consider her to be a fine lady who might have, you know, fallen on bad times, Miss Shirley, and they try and guess at her name and um, Mama says her name must be Stella and Rowena says, why, why do you think her name's Stella? And Mama says, because she's a fine lady. You know, there, there's, <laughs> there's awareness of class and there's a respect for that as well. Um. Yeah, but that's, it's not actually her name, though, is it? What did it say? Her name is quite a nice name. It was Isabella it's, or it's something. It's Isabella. Of, of I, think the we, like, yeah. I think we, we learned that very, very late. Um, yeah. Now, uh, one thing I did want to bring up that you, you sort of touched on but didn't really talk about was um, this is a very, very Catholic novel. Yes. Um, uh, now, am I right in saying you went to a, a Catholic school at, at some stage? Is this, do you think maybe this has got something to do with your identification with this novel, or is it or not? Oh, well, I went to a nice Catholic school called Christ the King College in Braybrook, um, which only had about 300 people, and it, it was filled with the people who, well, not exactly Ruth Park writes about, because it was such... It was in Braybrook, you had, you know, lots of Vietnamese, lots of Spanish people, very mixed working class neighbourhood. And you hear narratives about how racist the working class bogans are. But all these people mixed together, you know, the, the poor fifth generation Australians, the recently arrived Vietnamese, the Italians, the Greeks, and we ended up marrying each other, you know. So you would have a Vietnamese Italian wedding and the parents might still have racist things to say about each culture, but it would work. And so that was um, my Catholic school experience. A lot of my school friends got married quite early who came to that school and they're still together, but we're actually Buddhist. So my grandmother brought us up Buddhist because she survived the killing fields in Cambodia and I don't, I mean, I guess Buddhism made more sense to her after surviving a holocaust. But yeah, I had a lot of love and um, affection for, for this Catholic school I went to 
and I could understand these characters because they're characters that are my friends. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, um, uh, uh, Ruth Park we, uh, became a Buddhist too, of course, in, 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 in later life, uh, this, uh, somewhat, somewhat <laughs> after writing this, this novel. Um, but the, it, it's very much a portrait of that kind of working class uh, Catholic um, uh, yeah. uh, culture. Um, which is, I think, quite quite interestingly portrayed. I mean, there's an interesting uh, dynamic there between um, a, the the uh, I guess uh, guilt on one level, but also a kind of um, uh, a sort of heedlessness. Or you know, there's they kind of live it up. Huey, you know, there's a, there's this <laughs> wonderful description of Huey where he's. Park writes that he's he hasn't been to church for years and years, but he'd still punch anyone who said that it wasn't the one true faith. Right? Like, he doesn't, you know, he's, he, like he's not interested in practice, but at the same time, he's got this deep ingrained um, uh, uh, sense of of him of that informing his identity. Yeah. Um, and there seems to be that, that seems to be part of the tribalism to the point where there's actually that little sectarian uh, dispute going on too with um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Patrick Mr. upstairs Patrick, neighbor. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, unfortunately <laughs> named Patrick Diamond. You know, for, for, as a as a Protestant man. It's, it's, um, um, and that's one of those things I think you were talking about that's actually faded from our our, our culture quite a bit. I mean, it was quite strong at that point. Yeah. Uh, one of those things that actually dates the book uh, a little, and it's quite interesting to consider it from that historical point of view too. That's true. But what I loved about it, James, was also the mama's faith, which was very different from, you know, Huey's faith, where he goes to church once a year or goes to church when he really wants something or when he really needs something, like he wanted to win the lottery. I think he goes to church and he sees a sign from God. Whereas <laughs> mama's faith, she goes to church every week. She's a devout Catholic woman. And it's this faith, even though they were so poor and they were lacking material things, that gives them this innate sense of dignity, you know, this this idea that there's a beautiful passage in the sequel called um, Poor Man's Orange where Huey starts to wander. He starts to be, um, you know, he starts to be a philanderer. He starts to notice a young Italian girl sitting on a fence and Mama is really devastated because her faith puts a man and a woman together despite the fact that they might not have fallen in love, even in her, though in her case she did, and sets them up for life, for better or worse, and she would never cheat on him. And I think that is what gives her a sense of dignity. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and, well, she also has that... Uh, I, I, um when you were talking about the the child straying, I mean, it's uh, the, another quite common trope in Australian literature is missing children. Oh yes. Um, yeah. And this is uh, there is of course the character of uh, Thady, who is the the, the the son that she has lost uh, when he was six. He's been abducted at some point. Who haunts the entire he haunts the entire novel, doesn't he? He does. Mm. And one of the uh, you know really sad scenes is she thinks she's seen him. Um, and she mm. follows this young boy home and his family are alarmed because this lady with her hair messy, her face is all red, she's followed their son home and they sit her down and she says, that's my son, I found him. Um, and it's lucky that, well, it's very unlucky and it's also lucky that I think they might have had more money than her because they have these photo albums. So they show her these photo albums and it's only through the photographs that she can see that this boy is not her son. She can see through the years how his face has changed. He looks a bit like Thady, but he's not really. Mm. Whereas I don't know what would have happened if they were both equally poor. No photographs. This boy that's gone missing mm. for... About a decade, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's actually there are other missing children. Well, I mean, stretching the concept a little bit, there is of course the uh, Johnny uh, who who is hit by a truck very early yeah. in in the novel, and then of course there is um, uh, Rowie's uh, abortion, which is really like literally the central the central scene. Um, how do you see that relating to the the themes of the the novel? Uh, oh, that, that abortion scene. Oh, that, that abortion scene. Mm. That's an interesting scene because, you know, she, Ruth Park has set up this very um, dignified Catholic family. To have the daughter go ahead with an abortion might 
make you less sympathetic towards her, especially when the book was published in 1948. It would be her making a conscious choice. So fortunately, she flees. It's, it's quite, quite yeah. convenient from a plot it's a convenient point of, plot point of view. Point, it, actually, it? it actually dodges that issue yeah. um, where she almost goes through with it uh, but then runs away. Yeah. But then, and then is, uh, of course, attacked and uh, beaten and uh, loses the baby anyway. Yeah, um, but she's still quite virtuous in that mm, regard. She is mm. attacked. She doesn't do anything to get rid of the child herself. Yes, which, which takes the kind of issue of responsibility yeah. out of the question. Although, of course, she still feels guilty about it, though, doesn't she? She does feel that, you know, um, because she feels that she was prepared to go through with it. So she's kind of, you know, has that sense that um, it was only because she was too scared and ran away that she didn't actually go through with it, which, of course, uh, you know, feeds into her, her kind of Catholic. Guilt. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's, and she's quite punitive to herself about it because in the, in the latter book she keeps thinking about this lost child, you know, mm. and um, whether bad things that happen to her is as a result of her wanting mm. to get rid of this poor child. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, but, but despite all the gl gloom, there is actually, it's, it's quite romantic. Uh, there's there's a, quite a strong romantic thread and it, and it does actually come round to, you know, this... Um, there are all these kind of major uh, events that kind of uh, marked you know, uh, major sort of events in a lifetime. There's, there's there are deaths and there is uh, weddings um, and there is you know the abortion and there is uh, the the child dying uh, and then right at the very end, of course, you get the the wedding and yes. the and <laughs> the birth. So yeah. it, it's actually you know it, in a formal sense, it's actually a, a comedy. You know, it actually resolves on that note of harmony. Yeah, mm. it does. But it also is... I know Ruth Park wasn't Buddhist at that time. She was Catholic. It's also very circular, as in you read it and each event stands in its own right. Ruth Park didn't write this book to be sensationalist. So you've got abortion. Sure, you've got like shady characters. You have got... Um, you know, half-caste people. You've got the local town prostitute. A handful of drunks. But this happens quite naturally in the book and it's almost as if you're following a family and if you followed any family, these events aren't, uh, what do you call it, they're not unusual or unexpected. Mm. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're all everyday events and there's a quite nice symmetry too in, in um, Rowie's relationship, the first half with you know, Tommy which doesn't go well and then there's, there is... You know, it, it, in a way, the, the the structure of the book is is her descent into this um, moment of despair, and then her climb and and kind of reconciliation. Yeah. So it's quite a hope. You know, in a way, it's quite a hopeful and affirming book in a quite an interesting way, without without being at all sort of you know cloying or uh, naff in the way that these things can sometimes be. So it's quite interesting in that respect. Yeah. Um, now I should just say, with it's uh, we have. Um, uh, some ushers at the side there. If anyone does want to ask a question, uh, you're welcome to just throw your hand up. Uh, someone down the front here. Um, and, yeah, we're happy to uh, include you in the conversation. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, there's, there's Mike. Um, when the um, y a woman, the prostitute, gets beaten up by another two prostitutes because she's done the wrong thing by the madam... Mm. <laughs> But nobody goes to her help. Now, I understand that while it was going on, uh -huh. because, you know, you don't interfere. Yeah. But afterwards, she just lay in the gutter and uh, Mama and nobody else went down to help her. And I thought that was out of step with the rest of the book in terms of her generosity or compassion towards others was not there. It was sorely lacking. And it sort of shocked me in a way. Mm. Yeah, it is. It's a, it is shock, quite shocking that scene, isn't it? And um, and I think Park does actually say quite explicitly at one point that while while the fight is going on, that you know one of the kind of codes of this this little neighbourhood, this little enclosed, impoverished neighbourhood, is that you know, you don't get involved in other people's fights. Right? Um, but yes, I mean it's almost as if uh, in in sort of doing the wrong thing by the madam, she's actually done the wrong thing by the whole community. Um, in a sense, um, you know, with with uh, a daily being, you know, uh, despite being a kind of you know a criminal uh, uh, element, she's also in a sense a kind of matriarch of that little realm, you know, who 
But maybe maybe it, that's that's the reason. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, you're right. I think you're right. It, is, it does stand out for being quite a brutal, uh, a morally brutal kind of uh, scene. Could it be also, if you read it a different way, completely in accordance with Mama's character? Because she's very compassionate, but her compassion is quite insular. You know, she loves her family to bits and her immediate neighbours. She's very Catholic, so these prostitutes would prove a threat to this sanctity of the family. So um, she, she will watch, but she won't intervene or she won't go out and help someone who she believes is ruining a lot of lives. Now, this sounds morally inconsistent, but, you know, something quite interesting happened about 10 years ago when I was... Oh, I might have been 22 when I was in Footscray with my dad because he has a shop there. And there was a man sprawled out in the um, service station car park, just sprawled out. He must have been, you know, he, he must have been unconscious. Or, and there was no one around him. And it was getting dark. And I said, Dad, this guy might might not be okay. Let's go and have a look. And my dad said, Stop! Don't you go anywhere near him. And I said, why not? And my dad said, we can call an ambulance, but then we'll leave. Because there are lots of people dealing drugs in Footscray. And he said, look, if you stand next to him, his gang might bash you up. And that seemed like a very cold thing to do to this um, poor guy who was lying there. So we called an ambulance. And then my dad drove me home. And it seemed inconsistent because during the killing field years, his, his job was saving lives. He helped people, you know. Um, on the side because he could also do acupuncture and yet some people's beliefs or some people's fears overcome their, their sense of uh, compassion or their, their fear for their safety but I'm not sure <laughs> um, people do very inconsistent things well yes I guess I guess that's true I, um, yeah. I mean within the context of the novel um, yeah, I think I, I I sort of would see that scene as I guess demonstrating the you know, the, the kind of brutality, a kind of hard morality of the of the of that world, perhaps. Yeah. You know. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, we have another question. Um, I'd like to ask a question about what I observed in the novel. Um, well, I guess you might call it fatalism, uh, and the lack of of I guess aspiration, which um, I grew up um, in an Irish Catholic background in a small town in northern Victoria in the 50s. Oh, sorry. Um, and uh, one of my undying disappointments, and, and this is with respect to your discussion on the ghetto and, mm. and the pride and the value that people had in the ghetto, um, one of my undying disappointments was that I left Australia for a number of years and before I left, uh, the word to define the, um, I guess, the um, aspiring classes or the established classes was Anglo-Saxon. And when I came back, it was Anglo-Celtic. And I had a sense of disappointment in that because I had now become part of the majority, which I didn't really <laughs> want to be. Um, but um, when I read the book, even though you might have called this family one of my own, I couldn't identify with the fatalism because back in the 50s, in the background I came from, it was really all about aspiration. My parents were obsessed with uh, education, as I'm sure your parents were. Um, it's the same with any... Of, of the minority communities. But what I found in, in the book was a strong level of fatalism where people accepted their fate and nothing could be done. So I just wonder whether you'd like to comment about that. Oh, yeah, I, I think that's certainly there in the book. Uh, I, I think there is no one in that world is looking, no one in that world expects to ever get beyond it. You know, and even at the end, then that passage I, I, I read out, I think it's kind of stated that, um, you, know, you know, they can, they might, even if they do dream of maybe doing something else, they never actually will because they're just too ensconced in that in that uh, world. And yeah, and I, and I think it's. I mean, I, I'm not. 
Irish Catholic at all. But I think I, 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 I also grew up in a country town, and I, and I do recognise that uh, uh, it's not not universal. But this uh, that defensiveness that can um, spring up when. Uh, people are disadvantaged and impoverished it, it they become it becomes self reinforcing and i think this it speaks to i think what we're talking about with with the language and, and the inarticulateness uh, there's a, there's a few points in the novel where uh, that inarticulateness is uh, leads the characters to kind of retreat into themselves there's a, there's quite a nice little moment early on when they go to paddy's market and they pick up a volume of Shakespeare and I think uh, one of them you know, cites a line from Shakespeare which they've learnt at school and they immediately feel embarrassed they don't know what to do with this, suddenly they've got this elevated language and so what they do is they put it down and you know back away because <laughs> they don't know what to do with it and, and they, they don't have access to that realm but they're also slightly fearful of it and it, and it sort of feeds into a, a sort of a, a anxiety about a kind of an, a, a intellectualism or you know um, which in the end you know it becomes self-reinforcing I don't know if that if that interpretation is a bit heavy-handed I don't know what do you think no uh, I, yeah. I think that's a good interpretation yeah um, but uh, yeah, I mean that, that's that's sort of what I, I think. I mean, I think I can, without identifying with it, I can I can certainly sort of uh, recognise that. I think. Um, oh, um, yeah, well, the lady up front. I think there's, there was someone up the back as well, but maybe next. Oh, I, mean, I was brought up in a small Irish country town, but there's a huge difference between the the very very working class in the town. And the, the people, and even the very working class in our town, were a lot, lot richer than mm. the Darcys were. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about I mean, Ruth Park. I mean, da, Ruth Park's husband, Darcy Nyland, came from a very poor Irish Catholic family, but Ruth Park is actually from New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not quite sure. Maybe you do you know any any more about her, yeah. her background? Her upbringing? I think she was also working class. Her, her father was a machinist, I think, and her mother, um, I think, was a labourer. So, mm. and they they lived through the Great Depression, and I think her father tried to start his own business but went bankrupt. So mm. they <laughs> they did fall yeah. on some hard times. And they were, they were both uh, quite, uh, as well as being having that ferocious work ethic you referred to, they, they yeah. were both kind of autodidacts um, <laughs> to, to a large extent, you know. And um, I think she, Ruth Park writes about them, uh, you know, buying second-hand books at Paddy's Markets and so on and trying to educate themselves that way. Yeah. So um, they, in that sense, did push beyond that, that culture, but... Um, Certainly would have understood it. I think. Yeah. Um, there's one and someone down the back. Yes. I was just wondering if it was part of what the gentleman was describing as fatalism was related to the fact that both Ruth Park and Darcy Nyland were clearly, you know, maybe not tertiary educated, but clearly people who had a great deal of depth of thought and a complex thought and were professional writers, so you know, had a great grasp of language, were very articulate, and yet were living in a Surrey Hill slum, raising five children. So you know, their personal, so Ruth Park's personal circumstances may have had somewhat formed her opinion about the likelihood of anybody being able to get out of that environment without some kind of random outside intervention, like winning a lottery. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, I, I find it hard enough to imagine someone writing 60,000 words a week, but to imagine someone <laughs> writing 60,000 words a week while raising five children, I, I don't know, it just seems superhuman to me, is it? Yeah, and that's a wonderful observation because as the lady at the front was mentioning different classes of poor, you know, you, you can be poor. And what I think Ruth Park had and her husband had was they were materially poor, but they were w very wealthy and they had a lot of cultural capital. And the class of the Darcy's are completely lacking in cultural capital. That's why you mentioned when they picked up the bottle of Shakespeare wine, <laughs> they were very embarrassed about it because it was something that they had never, if you've had generations and generations of people who have never had cultural capital where education wasn't much of a priority, getting a job was, or, you know, supporting a family, that's not high on your list of priorities. You don't see the long-term benefits of putting someone through high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, no, I'm happy. <laughs> um, yeah. Dr. Roy, does anyone have another question? I think there's a question. There's one at the back. Eh? <laughs> Alice, I just want to thank you very much because it was so refreshing to have an honest dialogue about class because we, we spin so many myths in Australian society, don't we, about being egalitarian, that we're a classless society, whereas th these currents were clearly there in the past but we, we sort of cover them over in today's society with a few jokes about bogans but we don't really <laughs> look at the way in which our society has become so much more unequal. I would wondered if you'd like to comment on that. Oh, thanks so much for your kind comments. I was a bit nervous about tonight because when we mentioned class in Australia, as I was talking to James earlier on in, at the back while we are waiting, it's kind of unpopular to talk about class. You're either a raving Marxist. We like to pretend that class doesn't exist and we engulf it in a blanket of culture. So that's why we have the bogan. That's why we have the Chardonnay or Champagne sippers. It's got everything to do with culture. So we can talk about class through this um, blanket of culture. We're saying we're not really talking about class. We're just talking about characteristics of a specific group of people, a very large majority who, wore, who wear moccasins or who have rat's tails, who live in Frankston. And that is a lie. You're talking about class. And you're talking about people who don't really um, have cultural capital to buy organic foods or who don't have the time or inclination to cook healthy meals because they're supporting a large family of five. So the cultural capital has so much to do with it and yet underneath all that is class. It's some people have more money than others and having a lot of more money buys you more time with your kids, with your husband, you know, <laughs> more time to have healthier food. Um, we're, we're just about out of time. We could probably take another question if, if, if someone has one. Um, but uh, that, that's actually... Uh, just a quick one. quick one? Yes, yeah. sure, sure. Uh, Josie, in the, just before in the harp in the south, what's it called when you was before? <laughs> Missus, I think. The bit before the harp in the south. Before the harp in the south, you know, starts. She's written a book before that yeah. about you. Yeah. So I just think Josie tried to... Uh, Mama's sister... Um, you know, really, really tried to get out of her class by, uh, you know, studying accountancy. And, uh, you know, she went out and bought a business with the money, but no one would come to her because she was a woman. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. so she really, really tried. And in the end, she goes <laughs> off and has five children, you know. But she did try to get out of her class. She was really, really trying hard to get out of her class. And that was the one example I felt of you know, education, yeah. she really wanted to educate herself to, mm. to not be the woman of that time. Yes, well, with all this discussion of class, we actually didn't really get around to talking about uh, gender in this novel, which is a whole oh. other <laughs> uh, very interesting angle that, from which it could be approached. Um, but unfortunately, we are we're, we're out of time. Um, look, I want to thank you all for coming down tonight on this uh, rather stormy and blowy day. Uh, and if you could join me, please, in thanking Alice Parham. <laughs> <laughs>